Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Mario Ritter in Washington. Every day on this program, we bring you news from and about the United States and the world. This is what you will hear on today's program. You will hear stories from Phil Deerking, John Russell, Jill Robbins and Bruce Alpert, Ann Ball, and Anna Mateo. But first, we bring you this story about severe flooding in the state of Texas from Alice Bryant. Houston, a city in the American state of Texas, will face worsening flooding conditions as Tropical Storm Harvey continues to rain on the city. On Friday, Harvey, the strongest storm to strike Texas in 50 years, came ashore near Corpus Christi, about 354 kilometers south of Houston. It has since remained around Texas's Gulf Coast. The storm's rains submerged cars and flooded highways. Schools, airports, and office buildings in the fourth largest city in the United States were closed as high waters filled some neighborhoods. More flooding is expected to come as the storm moves back in the direction of Houston. Weather reports say some areas in Texas could have as much as 1.27 meters of rain from the storm. Brock Long is the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. At a news conference on Monday, he said that more than 30,000 people are expected to be placed temporarily in shelters. The area immediately surrounding Houston, called the Metropolitan Area, is home to 6.8 million people. It is also home to many oil refineries in the U.S. Many have stopped operations, likely for weeks, due to the storm, including ExxonMobil's facility in Baytown. It is the United States' second largest refinery. As of Monday morning, the shutdown reduced about 2.4 million barrels of oil, or 13% of daily U.S. production. The outages will limit the availability of U.S. gasoline and other refined products and push prices higher, experts said. Federal authorities predicted it would take years to repair the damage from Harvey. The rains brought back memories of Tropical Storm Allison, which struck Texas in 2001. It flooded 70,000 homes and caused $9 billion in damage. Damages are not likely to be as extensive as Hurricane Katrina in 2005, which killed 1,800 people in and around New Orleans. Nor will damages likely be as high as Sandy, which hit New York in 2012. Those storms caused $80 billion and $36 billion in insured losses respectively, according to Hanover Ray, one of the world's largest reinsurance companies. I'm Alice Bryant.
India and China have reached an agreement to end the most serious dispute in years between the Asian powers. The two sides agreed to settle a border dispute at Doklam in the eastern Himalayas. Increased tensions there had raised fears of a wider conflict between the two countries. India's foreign ministry says the decision followed diplomatic communications between Chinese and Indian officials. A quick removal of border personnel from the disputed area at Doklam has been agreed to and is ongoing, said a ministry statement on Monday. It added, We were able to express our views and convey our concerns and interests. China's foreign ministry said that Chinese soldiers will continue to patrol the area. A foreign ministry official said China will continue to exercise sovereignty rights to protect territorial sovereignty in accordance with the rules of the historical boundary. The announcement comes days before Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is expected to travel to China for meetings of the group of nations known as BRICS Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These talks are to take place next week. The timing of the BRICS summit had put pressure on China and India to find a solution before Modi's visit. The dispute over the Doklam Plateau in the Himalayas started two and one half months ago. It has lasted much longer than earlier border conflicts between China and India. The two sides disagree about other parts of their 3,500 kilometer long border. The conflict began when Indian troops prevented China from building a road at Doklam, a plateau disputed between China and Bhutan. Since then, about 300 troops from each side have been sent to the area. This has raised fears of a larger conflict. India has refused to leave the territory. It fears that Chinese control of the plateau would give China easy access to a small piece of land connecting central India to the country's northeast. China has accused India of entering its territory. The Indian government, however, has claimed that the plateau was disputed territory between Bhutan and China. India also said its forces had moved in to help its small neighbor. India wanted both countries to remove their troops. China had demanded that India pull its troops back from the disputed area. Chinese media also called on India to remember its defeat in a war fought between the two sides in 1962. In China, a spokesperson said, China hopes India respects the historical boundary and works with China to protect peace along the border on the basis of mutual respect of each other's sovereignty. Commentators in India welcomed the decision on Monday. They said both sides appeared to have found a face-saving solution. Former India diplomat K.C. Singh told NDTV television, India would not object to Chinese troops guarding the area because they did so in the past also. Singh also said what they, India and Bhutan, have objected to is changing the status quo, which is building a road. I'm Phil Deerking. On the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula, 
the desert turns green as clouds cover it like a blanket. This is the country of Oman's monsoon season. The natural event, which lasts for three months, draws hundreds of thousands of tourists with cool weather and beautiful views. It began this year on June 21st. A 60-day festival in Oman's Dufar region draws about 50,000 people every night for dance competitions, musical performances, and exorcisms. In the midst of the clouds, people celebrate Oman's cultural diversity of Arab, African, and Asian roots. Officials in Dufar region started the Monsoon Festival in 1998. The Monsoon Festival now draws performers from 40 countries, said festival director Talal al Masahli. He added that 60% of the visitors come from Oman, while the rest come from nearby countries such as Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. Each night, a different Omani city takes the main stage. The port of Suhar did a sea-themed show with cannons and a large wooden ship. The next night, a group from Bidbid chanted with swords while a musician blew into a ram's horn. Salam Ashur, leader of the local Ahmed al-Kabir Sufi order, said diverse groups use the festival to share their cultures. The Sufi order, for example, performed a musical exorcism in front of almost 500 people. Khalid al-Najjar is a meteorologist. He explains that the mountains surrounding Salala, Dufar's capital city, trap moisture from the Indian Ocean monsoon. Air pressure pockets above Saudi Arabia and Tibet drive air currents to Oman. These weather currents create a unique environment which has heavy fogs and lush mountains and coasts. Last year, some 650,000 people visited the region's beautiful mountains and valleys, according to the Omani Statistics Agency. So far this year, almost twice that number have visited. It's magical, said Muna al-Ajmi, an Omani chemical engineer visiting the region with two children. Thomas Wagman, on holiday from Dubai, noted, Compared to Dubai, this is just fantastic because you can be outdoors all the time. He added, You don't even have to worry about sunburn because there's no sun. I'm John Russell. At most American colleges, teachers give students grades that evaluate their performance in class. The grades range from A to F, with A the highest and F signaling failure. But some colleges do not use grades. Instead, teachers write reports on what the students did well and what they did not do well. The reports also include suggestions on how students can do better. Students and teachers say the written reports provide much more information than letter grades on how students are doing. But some students admit that their parents complain they cannot brag to family and friends that their child is an A student. Jessica Wooers, 21, is an early education major at Alverno College in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Alverno is a small Catholic college serving female students. Wooers said 
When she returns to her home in Illinois, some friends tell her they think it is strange she does not receive letter grades. But Wooers likes the detailed information her teachers provide. It has already helped her prepare teaching plans simple enough for young children to understand. I was asking a little too much of younger children, Wooers said. Her classmate, Angelina Nuno, transferred from a large state college where she struggled with her writing. Detailed suggestions from her Alverno teachers helped her write clearly. Soon, Nuno expects to begin tutoring fellow students to help with their writing problems. Ben Stumps is a senior at Hampshire College in Massachusetts. He said that he received traditional A through F grades at high school, but in many cases, he could not explain why he received the grades he did. Stump said students at Hampshire and other colleges without letter grades are more willing to take difficult classes. For example, Stump said he struggled in high school with science, but he was willing to take a science class in college because he did not risk getting a bad grade that could hurt his grade point average. And he found that he not only enjoyed the science class, but had the skills to successfully complete scientific research. Other schools that provide written reports instead of letter grades include Antioch University, with campuses in Los Angeles, California, and four other locations, New College of Florida, Prescott College in Arizona, Goddard College in Vermont and Washington, and Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies and Evergreen State College, both in Washington State. Indiana University did a report on the history of grading in America. It said Yale University in Connecticut was the first college to give out grades to differentiate student performance. In other words, it wanted to show how students compared to each other. Yale started in the late 1700s with a top grade of optimi and a grade of inferiores for students not doing very well. Mark Hauer is interim provost at Antioch University in Los Angeles. He said international students often must adjust to college life in America. Written evaluations can help them understand what is expected of them better than a letter grade that tells them very little, Hauer said. Nevertheless, some people worry what will happen to Antioch students when they apply for graduate school and jobs. Will they be able to compete with students who have traditional grades? Howard says yes. Most admissions officers and employers welcome the more detailed information Antioch provides, he added. Rachel Rubenstein is Dean of Academic Support at Hampshire College. She said people running companies do not use letter grades to evaluate their workers. They value employees based on whether they can do their jobs well. Rubenstein said colleges should do the same. Letter grades do not tell you nearly enough about how students are doing. William Copeland is director of the Public Affairs Program of the Maxwell School at Syracuse University in New York. He said most colleges do not give students enough information about how grades are determined. But he questions if students will work hard if they are not worrying about getting good grades. Kids are motivated by grades, Copeland said. There are very few kids who are self-motivated. Vanessa Rios, 32, earned an undergraduate degree from Antioch University in Los Angeles. She is now working toward her master's degree at Antioch. 
Rio said, just because students are not getting letter grades does not mean students can get away without working hard. The detailed reviews by teachers mean they need to understand what is being taught, she said. What it, not having grades, does do is reduce the anxiety level, Rios said. Kathy Lake is vice president for academic affairs at Alverno. She said students will be disappointed if they think no grades means less work. At many colleges, students stay up all night before big exams to try to learn information they were supposed to learn over months in the classroom. That just doesn't work at Alverno, Lake said. At Alverno, teachers evaluate students at each class, meaning one night of studying will not be nearly enough, she said. I'm Bruce Alpert. And I'm Jill Robbins. Some people are using old books to create works of art, including sculptures. They can change the shape of a hardcover book so it becomes three-dimensional, for example. The resulting sculpture has not only a length and width, but depth. The process can be very simple, and the result is often beautiful. There are many kinds of book folding. Artists fold, bend, and sometimes cut a book's pages while keeping them together. The artwork can be hung on a wall or placed on a table. They look impressive on the wall, says writer Candace Caldwell. A group of six of these on the wall together can look really beautiful, and they're just really simple folds. Caldwell operates a blog called The Refab Diaries. She writes about repurposing everyday objects like books for uses other than what they were designed for. In 2003, Caldwell was making clocks from old books when she saw plans for a simple book-folding project in a do-it-yourself magazine. She tried it. She has since taught several friends and her mother how to create wall art from books. Claire Youngs has written a book called Folded Book Art. She says book folding is easy. From her home in England, she told the Associated Press by email that it looks as if it is complicated and unachievable, but it is really easy to do. You just don't tell anyone how easy it is, and they will be amazed at your creations. I'm Ann Ball. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. In 2016, more than 60,000 people died in the United States because of drugs. That is the highest number of drug deaths and the fastest yearly increase in recorded history. Early data suggests that deaths from opioids and other drugs will continue to rise in 2017. Drug overdose is now the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. U.S. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein made this statement in June 2017 
at a news conference with drug enforcement agency officials. Rosenstein called it a horrifying surge in drug overdoses. He added that drug abuse is wrecking families and communities throughout the U.S. More than two million Americans have some sort of physical dependence on opioids. Opioids are a type of painkiller that are legally prescribed to many people. Opioids are addictive if people take too much of them or take them for a long period of time. However, there is a new and even more dangerous part of the opioid crisis, and it is happening much more often. This is the making and selling of extremely strong, illegal types of drugs that copy ones that already exist. One such drug is fentanyl. Fentanyl is so strong that even the smallest amounts, as little as two or three grains, can kill. Police officers and other first responders who try to help drug overdose victims are often affected by the drug themselves. DEA does not yet have data on this part of the problem. However, officials say there is a clear increase in cases where first responders have become ill while handling evidence or helping overdose drug victims. Chuck Rosenberg is a high-level official at the DEA. He has warned emergency responders to take great care in drug overdose cases. He advises them to wear protective gear, such as masks and gloves. Even dogs trained to find illegal drugs are at risk. Their handlers have begun carrying antidotes for both the animals and themselves. However, these new synthetic drugs are so powerful that many doses of antidotes are sometimes needed to save the rescuers. Rosenberg summed up DEA advice to emergency teams at an overdose scene. If you don't know what it is, assume there's something in it that will kill you. The extremely fast rise in opioid problems is also happening in Europe. The European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction reported in June 2017 that dangerous synthetic drugs similar to heroin and morphine are a growing health threat in the European Union. Experts at the center say on its website that more than 8,000 people died from overdose in the EU in 2015. This is the third year in a row that the number of overdoses has increased in the EU. And the center warns that drug-related deaths in Europe could be much higher. For this, it blames delayed reporting and under-reporting in some countries. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. That's our program for today. We hope these stories have informed you and helped improve your understanding of American English. I'm Mario Ritter, reporting from Washington. For all of us here at VOA Learning English, thanks for spending some time with us today. Join us tomorrow for another Learning English program from the Voice of America.